the text for this morning is the, the word of Jesus, the sixth word of Jesus from the cross, as we find that in uh, verse 30. He said, it is finished. People loved by God, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, and any guests watching this live stream on Good Friday. If only, that's a, a well-known expression, I think, when you have a, a project for school or a paper for university and you procrastinate and you leave it to the last minute, the night before maybe, and you're unable to finish it properly, and then you think, if only I had started earlier. Or you hear someone using bad language, taking God's vain and, and name in vain maybe, and you think later on, if only I'd said something to that person, but I didn't dare do it. Or when you're old and you think back on your life, you think, if only I had spent more time with my children, if only I had spent more time doing things with my wife or spent time with the Bible, if only. You see that that actually means I didn't do something I should have. Or I did something and I didn't do it right. And that can eat at you at the end of a day that you think, if only I had have done this and that, or the end of a week, or at the end of your life. If only. We so often have unfinished business. Well, with that, that in mind, I'd like to pay attention to the sixth word that Jesus spoke from the cross. In the original language, it's actually just one, one word. A prayer to God, but it's also a word to us. And we see then that he spoke that word to God the Father. And in the second place, he spoke that word to us. So first of all, Jesus said it is finished to God the Father. Congregation, Jesus said from the cross at the end of his life, it is finished. He didn't have to think if only I had done this yet or if only I had done that or finished this. No, he had done everything that he was sent to this earth to do. And that says that in already in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, all was now finished. There was nothing left for him to do here on earth. He had done everything perfectly that he was supposed to do. Totally finished it. Completed in full obedience in perfect love for God the Father, his Father. Brothers and sisters, will any of us be able to say that at the end of our lives? It is finished. I did everything I was supposed to do. Who could say that at, at the end of their life? Even who could say that at the end of a single day? I did everything I was supposed to do, and I did it perfectly, faultlessly. No one. Well, Jesus could say that at the end of every day he lived on earth. And he could say it at the end of his life. He could say, as a sum of all the days and the weeks and the years of his life, it is finished. That was his cry of victory from the cross. He gave up his spirit there as the one and only one who had truly finished everything that God required of a man, of him in particular. It is finished. You realize that that expression implies then a commission, a task which had to be completed. Jesus had such a task, a calling given to him by God the Father. And he spoke of that throughout the Gospel of John earlier on. For instance, John 4, verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, to accomplish his work. And John 17, verse 4, he prayed, 
Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. His task was to glorify the Father in heaven and to do his will. And that was already the calling and the task God gave Adam when he created him in the beginning in paradise to glorify God and to do his will. If he did that, he would live with God in perfect peace forever. But Adam didn't do that. He didn't fulfill his calling and task on earth. He fell short at the fall into sin. And then also afterwards, along with all his descendants, along with us. The same with us today as Adam's children. How often don't we neglect to glorify God's goodness in thought, word, and deed? How often don't we follow our own will instead of God's will? Even as Christians, that's our struggle. Well, God sent his son to this earth as the second Adam. The second Adam with the same calling and the commission he gave the first Adam. Do his will. Glorify his name in all his thoughts, words, and deeds. Think about this. Jesus' task as the second Adam was much more difficult, though, than, than that of the first Adam. If you think about that, too, think it through. Think about this. Jesus' task as the second Adam was more difficult because Jesus came into a world that was already broken because of, of the fall. A world affected in so many ways by sin, whereas Adam was created in paradise, in a perfect world. It was good. And Jesus was therefore also tempted as we are, without sin, but tempted. And in addition to that, he had to also carry the heavy, heavy burden of the shortfall of all our thoughts, words, and deeds. God's wrath against the sins of the whole human race. And those things made his task infinitely more difficult than Adam's task in the beginning. The burden of all those sins of Adam and his descendants, us included, the just wrath of God against all those sins too, weighed down on Jesus more and more from the beginning of his life to the end of his life on earth. An immense burden that he had to carry. So Jesus' task was not only obedience to God's will and to glorify God's name in that, but also at the same time to bear the burden of the just and eternal wrath of God against totally all the sins of those the Father had given him to bear. If you, if you think about it, it's a wonder that, that God's son was willing to take that immense task, wasn't it? Take on everything we failed in and God's full and just wrath against us for, for that. Boys and girls, if at dinner your, your brother drops a, a plate piled high with food on the ground so that the plate breaks into a thousand pieces... And there's a big mess on the floor, a big gob of food on the floor. And then your dad says to you, you, you clean up that mess and pay for that plate. I think you would protest, right? I didn't do it. Why should I clean that up? And why should I pay for that broken plate? Why should I do that? But it was the will of the father that Jesus, our brother, would clean up and pay for what we broke and the mess we made. And it's an amazing thing then that Jesus said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God, and it's written, as it's written in the scroll of the book, Psalm 40. He started that work at his birth. He fully finished it at his death so that he could say, It is finished. Now, think about a, think that through a little bit more, what was finished there, a, a number of aspects to that work which Jesus finished there. There are a lot, number of aspects to that. He had, he had kept those whom the Father had given him, all of them. When the soldiers came to arrest him in Gethsemane, he said, well, 
If you seek me, let these men go. He gives himself up to be reviled and condemned and spit on and crucified for all those the Father gave him. He fulfilled that task. He offered himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, carried the burden of the guilt of our sins and the wrath of God all the way to the cross. Which is why all those Old Testament sacrifices and the shedding of blood came to an end. He fulfilled all of that. He fulfilled all the Old Testament scriptures. He overcame Satan. Satan tempted him. If anything, while Jesus was on earth, Satan was worked the hardest to tempt him. And he taunted him via the Jewish leaders who called out, you saved others, why don't you come down from the cross, save yourself and come down from the cross. And he could have very easily. But Jesus would not let himself be drawn away in any way from the task that he had been given to save sinners. He defeated Satan in that. He fulfilled that task too. Congregation, think of what that cost him as true man too. Our, our brother, according to the flesh, it cost him incredible suffering, rejection, insults, condemnation, pain, thirst, and above all, God forsakenness. And ultimately, his life as a son of God in the flesh and that should fill us with wonder and worship, shouldn't it? Oh, Lord Jesus, that you fulfilled all that for me. You were willing to do this for me because it wasn't your guilt and your punishment. It was all mine. It's your grace that you took that on yourself and you finished it for me. Now, when someone says it is finished, that also implies to not just the task, but also that the goal has been achieved. A goal has been reached. Jesus fully reached the goal of the task he had been given. When he spoke that sixth word from the cross to his father, he in fact presented his completed work to his father. Good. He could have said, Father, it is finished. And right after that, he spoke. He, he, he first had to say, I thirst. And that was because he needed something in his mouth, some fluid in his mouth to be able to speak. And then he spoke, it is finished, and afterwards he said his seventh and last word from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he died. Then he was finished. Congregation, we also know that the Father accepted Jesus' work as finished. Because on, on Easter Sunday, the Father raised Jesus from the dead, gave him glorified life. Life that has left the, the full curse behind and has an open heaven above. In fact, God, the Father, gave Jesus all the power and authority in heaven and on earth afterwards. As a reward that he had finished. And he gave him the spirit of life so that he could call all those whom the Father had given him to eternal salvation by the spirit. And to glorified life with him afterwards. Congregation, because Jesus finished his task, sinners who are dead in their sins and trespasses like you and I can be saved, gloriously saved from eternal condemnation and can look forward to everlasting peace and joy. And doesn't that make you want to embrace this Savior who finished everything for you, which you should have done? And more finished in that you should embrace him in faith and love and serve him every day. We come to the second part of the sermon. Jesus spoke that word. It is finished not only to the father, but also to us. To all the people who were standing there near the cross at the time. 
And via them, via the Gospels, which they wrote also to us. And it was important for him to do that. <clears throat> That's why he said beforehand, I thirst. He wanted to be able to have something to drink so that he could speak out that sixth word loud and clear in the hearing of those who were there. And he wanted that word recorded so sinners today could also hear from the gospel. It is finished. Because congregation, we all still have that calling from God to love him and serve him in every thought, word, and deed. We still have that calling. That's the goal. That's the goal of our lives before God. Our purpose that God is glorified in everything. Our lives will ultimately be judged according to that calling, that purpose. Did we fulfill our life's calling and reach the goal of our lives? That glorification of God. Or maybe we feel pretty good about our life. There may be people who would say, well, I had a good life. I had a good life. I achieved a lot. I saw a lot. I had a lot of good times. I had success. But feeling good about your life is not the point of your life. The point of your life is whether your life reached the goal that God gave that life of yours. Whether you glorified his name. That's what your life is really about. As it says in the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to enjoy God and to glorify him. And it's by that measure that we'll all be judged when we leave this life. Not how we felt about ourselves or how successful we were in living a, a nice life. No, the supreme judge will ask, did your life bring glory to me in everything? And brothers and sisters, boys and girls too, can you ever say, if it comes to that, can you say, I fulfilled that purpose? I never fell short in giving God all the glory in all my thoughts, all my words, my deeds. Can you say, I always gave him the glory he had a right to from me. Throughout my whole life, I was always full of devotion and love and zeal for him with whoever I was and wherever I was. Would you ever be able to say that the, at the end of even a single day, let alone at the end of your life? Think that through. None of us would ever be able to say that, would we? Because we fall short every day again, don't we? And we'll continue to fall short to the very end, won't we? We can only come to one conclusion. I'll never be acceptable to God as I am. Also as a Christian, never be acceptable to God as I am in myself. I'm never of myself going to be able to live with him in his perfect joy and glory of myself. So what do you need to do in order to be restored to the almighty creator, your almighty creator and God? I need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Embrace him in faith as we confess in the Belgian Confession. Embrace him. And that means that I don't need to try to achieve anything before God, but I need to fully rest in the finished work of Christ. Rest in his work. Being saved means resting completely on Jesus' finished work. As Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe you think that you just need to fix this and improve that in your life yet to be more acceptable to God. But you know what? You'll only get tired of trying harder and harder to do things better, to try to appease God. Tr tired of trying to make what you say or you do more perfect. Producing more genuine repentance, for instance, acting with greater piety, showing more love and charity, 
if you think doing those things will get you closer to God, you're going to tire yourself out completely. Because the harder you try, the more you realize how much you still need to do. And you'll never get finished. But brothers and sisters, boys and girls, Jesus said, it is finished. And therefore, you can rest in his finished work. God the Father was satisfied with Jesus' work, and he showed that with the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. And if God was satisfied with his work, that it was finished, truly finished, shouldn't you be satisfied with his work too? You need to rest in his work then. His finished work is a pillow for a weary head that would of itself never be able to find rest anywhere else. As someone has said, I can try a hundred times harder. And if I live another hundred years, I'll never be able to say I'm finished. It's finished. But brothers and sisters, you don't need to finish anything in that regard. If Jesus said it is finished, what can you still add to his work? Just thank him. Believe in him. Thank him. Praise him. Exalt him. Follow him. Lord, so amazing that you did that for me. That you, God's son, were willing to go through all of that for me and finish it. Because I'm the cause of all your suffering on that Good Friday. My sins, my shortcomings, my lack of trust, my doubts, my lack of zeal. You were willing to descend into outer darkness on the cross on that day for me. And you bore it to the very end. Congregation, Jesus finished it all for you. So don't ever think you need to add anything to his work. That your repentance or your good deeds of thankfulness or your piety have to add anything. Or can add anything. Because if you think that, it's going to make you restless. Is my repentance genuine enough? Am I thankful enough? Have I loved God enough? And then you won't tr truly find rest. You won't find the rest there is actually available in Jesus' finished work. You'll keep thinking, I have to do more. I have to do more. No. Do not seek your rest in what you do. In your contrition. In your good deeds. In your prayers. In your fighting temptations. In your participation in church life. In all your good gifts. All those things. Good as they are in themselves. Do not count for anything. At the remembrance of just one sin. In your life. Then all your hope and confidence in yourself. Are gone in a flash again. Because you base that hope and confidence. On your own. Doings. Instead of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Rest in him. See, brothers and sisters, the more you simply do that, only rest in that finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more truly repentant and thankful you will become. If you only rest in him, then you won't think that you have to bring up those things out of yourself. They'll come out of your faith in Christ, your embracing of him. Like the branches bear fruit if they're attached to the vine. You won't depend in any way on your deeds and sentiments. But they will be the fruit of your faith in Jesus Christ. And his finished work. And then you want to do good. You'll strive to do good with all your effort. Not in order to win God's favor. But because you have received his favor in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You want to show love. Not because you think you can obtain life that way in any way. 
but because you have received life in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Our love and our works are never going to be perfect before God, but Jesus' work was and is. He could say it is finished. And he said that so we would seek him and seek nothing besides him. That's why he said that word for us, too, from the cross. So congregation, at the end of every day and every week, we should examine our life in the light of our calling from God. And that's not a pleasant thing all the time. We need to, but we need to do that in order to get rid of false rest and hope. Because if we rely in any way on ourselves, oh, I did this and I did that. And if we rely any way on ourselves, we're going to end up saying, what if I'm called up out of this life tonight or tomorrow? If only I'd done that yet. And if only I had said that yet, if only. No, just we just need to remember Jesus sixth word from the cross. Also for us, it is finished. And then you can rest in his finished work for you. He spoke that that word to everyone who has ears to hear. And brothers and sisters, at the at the end of my life, I won't be able to say any more at all. I won't be able to say any more. I'll try harder. I'll try to do the right thing tomorrow because it's not possible then anymore. Your life is what it is. It is what it is. Unfinished in God's presence. You fell short in loving him with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and with all your strength. And then, and then when you stand before him, there won't be any time to make things right anymore. Even if, even if, you were given another year, or like Hezekiah, another 15 years. But then, and especially also then, you can recall that word that Jesus spoke from the depths of his suffering on Golgotha. It is finished. Rest in that. Rest in his finished work alone.